Good afternoon, bon après midi. Welcome to this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. I'm coming to you live from the brutalist majesty of the Rutherford Physics Building at McGill University in beautiful downtown Montreal, where research has continued fluidly through the pandemic, stubbornly refusing vitrification to a glassy state. If you're in the Zoom session and you prefer not to be recorded or live streamed, please log out of Zoom and join us via YouTube. This afternoon, we will have a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. To ask a question in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature following the talk. To ask a question in YouTube, please enter it into the chat. The questions will be relayed to me by my sidekick following the talk. After the Q&A session, the live stream and recording will stop. Professors uh, will be asked to log out of the Zoom session and undergrads, grads and postdocs, as well as any other non-faculty in the Zoom session will be invited to the après colloque, a chance to get to know the speaker in a more intimate setting. With that, I will now pass to Professor Paul Francois to introduce the speaker. Paul. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, yeah. so uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, Professor Liza Manning. So uh, Professor Manning is a professor of physics at Syracuse University and funding director of Bio-Inspired Syracuse Institute for Material and Living Systems. So uh, Professor Manning heard a bachelor in physics and mathematics from the University of Virginia in 2002, then uh, went to grad school at UC Santa Barbara, where she earned a PhD in physics in 2008, advised by Jean Carlson and James Langer. Then she worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science from 2008 until she joined faculty at Syracuse University in 2011. So as you will see, uh, Professor Manning's research uh, is focused on uh, essentially mechanical properties of both biological tissues and the failure of disordered materials. So she has applied her work to many, many things from uh, cell migration, pattern formation, cancer, and even failure in materials from glasses to earthquake force. So uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Manning today. Uh, she's a very well recognized scientist, won many awards. I'm going to list a few of them. She was highlighted as one of Science News top 10 scientists under 40. Then she received the 2018 Maria Gopert Meyer Award from the American Physical Society, uh, the 2016 IUP. UPAP, I guess, Young Investigator Prize, a Simon's Investigator Award, a Sloan Fellowship, many, many awards. And then as an NSF Carrier Awardee and a Cultural Scholar, she has developed innovative programs to help recruit and retain a diverse group of scientists in STEM. Um, and so that's, that's it for my introduction. So we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Manning. And so uh, I'm looking forward to her talk. Uh -huh. So thanks, Paul, so much for the kind introduction. Can everybody hear me OK? Uh, it's good? OK, good. Yes, very good. Um, and and um, before we get started, I want to highlight that this is a very interdisciplinary talk. And so if you have a question during the talk, uh, please feel free to interrupt and ask it. Uh, I'm told you can enter it in the chat window, and uh, then uh, we they'll, they'll let me know and interrupt me. And it would be doing a favor to everyone because if you have a question in in an in interdisciplinary talk, I assure you someone else has the same question. And so go ahead and ask it because you will be helping everyone. Um, I will explain a little later exactly what's going on in this uh, front slide. But um, I want to highlight that these are some pictures that come uh, from biological systems. So the one on the left hand side here over here is um, extracellular matrix made up of collagen, which is found in your body uh, sort of in many places um, and cartilage and things like that. And then here is um, some cells taken uh, from the lungs of human patients. And uh, the question of, we'd like to answer about the, these things today is how can we explain their emergent behavior? And so the title of my talk is a little, I apologize, it's a little maybe grandiose, I don't know. I didn't mean it to be, but um, I wanna emphasize that biological tissues, I really have started to think about them as mechanical metamaterials. And I'll try to make the case to you today that that's like not just me trying to use a bunch of buzzwords in one sentence, but it's like a real thing that we can justify. <laughs> okay, so before I, you know, talk about what I really want to sort of tell you the science, I have to tell you about the people who did the work. So this is my group um, at Syracuse University, picture taken pre-pandemic, clearly. Um, and um, I'm going to highlight work done in collaboration with Ojan Damavandi, who's 
Uh, this gentleman here, who's a postdoc in my group, Varda Hegg, who's a postdoc that I share with a few other folks at the University of Oregon and a few other places. And then uh, Chris Santangelo, who recently moved uh, as a faculty member to Syracuse University. Okay, so I want to start this talk by asking you, are you a solid or a fluid? Okay. And if this wasn't some crummy, it's lovely, but Zoom meeting, right? You'd be shouting out things in the audience right now. It'd be dynamic and you'd be interacting with other humans. It'd be really fun. So let me pretend some of you shout solid and some of you shout fluid. <laughs> and you're all right, of course, uh, because there's fluids in your body. Um, but uh, I would argue that most of what you think of as your corporal body, like what you need to kick a football or to hold a baby, you have to support shear stresses. And so your body, therefore, what you think of as your body, you think of as being solid. Um, but there's a lot of interesting cases uh, where that solidity breaks down. So one of those cases is during early embryonic development. So this is a sort of classic movie of zebrafish embryonic development. And so these cells up here are the cells that are going to become the zebrafish embryo. And this is the yolk. And you'll see they divide and divide. And then there's a place where they start to move and rearrange and gastrulate. So they're moving over large distances and they're changing neighbors. So you can zoom in on that part where they just start to move. And this is an image taken from Eva Maria Schatz Collins's lab. And it's a picture of nuclei now that are inside the cells that are stained. So it looks like all of these nuclei are separated from one another, which is true. But you can imagine that there are cell bodies basically filling up all of the space in this movie. Okay, and what I hope that you notice is the motion of those cells is very much like you would imagine a fluid to be at this stage, right? They're jostling past one another, some are moving, they're changing neighbors, uh, very, very what you would imagine to be fluid-like. All right. So uh, uh, more recently, there was this like uh, a very nice paper that uh, came out in Nature a couple years ago now um, that emphasizes that actually in many developing organisms, there's actually a fluid to solid transition that happens as a function of space inside the developing organism. And then that gradient in fluidity at the tissue scale is really necessary to form the shape of the embryo. In this case, it's the elongation of the zebrafish tail. Um, and so I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, but the idea I want to tell you is that this idea is not just an idea anymore. It's emerging as a really important paradigm that tissues are tuning their global sort of emergent macroscopic fluidity in order to do perform functions and tasks. And sometimes you need to be solid like so that you can support shear stresses or for example, buckle to form certain shapes and development. And sometimes you want the tissue to be fluid like so that the cells can move over long distances or elongate or really change global tissue shape easily. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanna mention uh, because I showed you examples where the cells were all touching each other. So they were just groups of cells is that your body is not just composed of cells that are all touching each other. There's also, they secrete uh, extracellular matrix, and those sort of structures also form large components of your body. And the interesting thing about that is it also has a floppy to rigid transition. So extracellular matrix, especially collagen, um, is usually in its nascent form extremely floppy. And I'll talk about why later, but it's extremely floppy. And so it's created in this floppy state. Um, but then what happens is as cells pool or tissues pool on this extracellular matrix, there's this very, and sometimes quite sharp rigidity transition. So as you strain this extracellular matrix, it stiffens dramatically by several orders of magnitude. And so that is another type of uh, floppy to rigid transition that we might like to understand. And is also, it turns out, plays a very important role in biological processes. Cells use that so-called strain stiffening behavior as cues a lot of the time, and especially in diseases like cancer. 
Okay, so this is the slide that tells you that, that it's kind of in cancer sometimes. So it's pretty clear um, that if you stiffen extracellular matrix around a group of cells, that it really promotes malignant transformation in that group of cells in many cell types. And so one of the ways that you can start to think about these sort of floppy to rigid transitions in extracellular matrix is they can be a signal for diseases or disease tissue that you might want to avoid. Okay, so that's the setup. Okay, yeah, and so we have a preprint on like what happens when you have groups of cells interacting with ECM in case any folks here are interested, but that's not the focus for today. Okay, so asking you, are you a solid or a fluid? Um, let's make that a more precise, more, <laughs> slightly more physical question, which is how do mechanical interactions between cells, fibers, or cells and fibers dictate the emergent mechanics of a tissue? That's the question that we want to understand. Okay. And the other point I want to make is, you know, you are all physically minded people. I love giving talks to people that <laughs> think like I do, because I think it's sort of remarkable that how much we take emergent mechanics for granted. And, you know, I feel like a colloquium may not be complete if you're doing condensed matter or anything without a quote from Phil Anderson. So I'm going to provide one here. Um, we are so accustomed to the rigidity of solid bodies um, that we don't it accept its almost miraculous nature, that it is not contained in any simple law of physics, although it is a consequence of them, right? Like, why is a ruler stiff? Why? <laughs> How? Okay. So, you know, I would say understanding emergent properties in these especially rigidity properties, I want to emphasize that it's difficult, even with extremely simple models. So in general, emergent properties are many body problems, which we know are difficult to analyze. So a really good example is sand, which I also study sometimes. Um, and, you know, in the simplest case, you can model sand by literally elastic spheres, like almost perfectly elastic spheres. And I challenge you to make a pile of elastic spheres and predict this specific emergent behavior that occurs in them, like force chains. So these happen to be disks where they are um, birefringent. And so you can actually see the forces running through these sand piles. So those bright spots are the force chains, the chains of force that emerge out of this like simple elastic spheres because they're disordered and they're all piled on top of one another. And I mean, you all know that sand is really tricky because I'm assuming that most of you have walked on a beach before, right? And so if you've walked on a beach, you know that you're walking and the sand is supporting your weight, right? It's supporting your weight, therefore it's a solid. Okay, but then you pick it up, especially if it's not cohesive wet sand, but pretty dry sand, and it sifts through your fingers and the way it behaves there is just like a fluid, right? And not very much has changed between that solid state and that fluid state, really. There's a small change in density, but very small. So how does that work? How does that rigidity transition work? Okay, there's many other examples too. This sand is my favorite, but you you are all for, you know very intimately familiar if you think about it with how weird this is. Okay, the silver lining, even though emergent dynamics are difficult to predict because there are many body problems, is that as we know as physicists like or physical scientists, you often get universal features if you look at the limit of large statistics, right? So it could be if you get lucky that you could focus on universal properties that actually don't depend too much on the details of a specific model and they emerge from a big class of models. And so that is going to be our guiding principle. Okay, for those of you who are um, interested very much in the bio biology, um, I, I do tend to think of myself actually these days as mostly a biophysicist, despite my best best efforts to not become one um, because I'm really interested in the molecular mechanisms that drive these features in biological systems. Because of course that's really relevant for things like disease. Um, and so it, it's, so my point though is, is thinking about emergent mechanics is really important if what you wanna do is identify a molecular mechanism because which mechanical and morphological features of tissues you know, you want to know which require specific programming and which just emerge for free from rather generic interactions and activity. So for example, if you see a wave in a living organism, is that wave because of a specific chemical or does it just sort of happen in that medium as a low energy excitation rather naturally? That's the type of question you can ask. 
is I think important to ask. Okay, so the question that has been driving me crazy for about five years now is what are the physical mechanisms that give rise to emergent rigidity in those tissues I just showed you, to those cellular systems and to those extracellular matrix systems? Okay, and I, I think I'm very excited. Uh, you asked for me to give this colloquium at a good time because we're just about to put a paper on the archive, I think on Monday. And this is like, I, I call it my rigidity manifesto. You'll see why. Um, because I think we really finally have like a really good answer to this question. Um, and the answer is, is that biological tissues are meta materials. They're mechanical meta materials in a very strict sense, I will tell you later. They acquire rigidity differently from examples that physicists are used to, such as molecular materials like crystals or glasses, or even most granular materials. And to answer this question, we need to develop a, <laughs> a rigidity manifesto of sorts. You need to come up with a new theory of rigidity. So, you know, secretly, I'm going to tell you, well, not so secretly, you're about to see it, um, about a new theory of rigidity we have developed. Okay. So why do we need something like that? Let me give you an example, again, sand, which is my favorite one, that is simple and intuitive. So our intuition, I mean, what we learn in like first year physics or chemistry is that there's an equation of state for materials. And if I want something to become solid, I can either decrease the temperature or increase the pressure, right? So let's focus on the increase the pressure part. Materials solidify as I push on them as they get more crowded, as the packing fraction or the number density increases. Why? Well, there's, there's a simple answer to this. And it's easiest, I think, to see in this sort of idealized case of disordered spheres at zero temperature, which is called particulate jamming. That's what's it called in the literature. But it's simple. So there is, let, imagine a container of squishy marbles. So let's say spheres in 3D. Um, the number of degrees of freedom in that system is the number of marbles, the number of particles in my jar, times the dimensionality, because the marbles can move up and down, front and back, side to side, right? So the number of degrees of freedom is just the number of particles times the number of dimensions. And then if these particles start to get crowded, they begin to touch one another. And every time they create a new contact, that creates an energetic constraint on the mechanics of the system. So that is a constraint. Okay, the number of such constraints are just the number of neighbors per particle times the number of particles. And then I have to divide by two because each bond is shared by two particles. So the number of constraints in the system is the number of particles times this Z, which is the number of contacts per particle divided by two. In mean field, we expect then, very simply, rigidity to occur when these two quantities are equal, when the number of degrees of freedom equals the number of constraints. And you can even do the math here. That means Z equals 2D, right? So it's, it's sort of if this average number of contacts per particle is less than this critical number, two times the number of dimensions, then the system is under constrained. This happens at low densities, and the system is floppy. Right? There's just not enough, enough constraints to balance the degrees of freedom in the problem. So there are zero modes, right? At high densities, this uh, Z, the average coordination is greater than 2D and the system is over constrained. Okay, so that's cool. Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of stuff in the literature. Um, it gives you sort of topologically protected excitations and some types of mechanical metamaterials and all sorts of, and it, and it works really well actually for jars of marbles. <laughs> it actually works, um, which is a little surprising because this is a mean field argument, but it works. Okay. So now we're gonna get a little bit more precise um, because the whole point of this talk is you have to get a lot more precise. So let's get a little more precise. Okay, so a lot of folks that have studied rigidity already, especially in the mathematics and structural engineering literature, think about these bar hinge frameworks. And so um, if I have one of these sort of bar hinge frameworks in two dimensions, let's say that I have these four points. Well, in two dimensions, that gives me eight degrees of freedom. Right? And then I have these four constraints, you can see, 
And then I have three rigid body motions in 2D, right? I can translate this way, I can translate that way, that's two, and then I can rotate, that's three, right? And that gives me one non-trivial floppy mode, right? So that means this system is under constraint. Okay, now I can add another bar, <laughs> right? And I can make this system uh, just isostatic so there are zero non-trivial floppy modes anymore. So this is an example. And the reason I'm bringing this up, this, this goes under the moniker of call either Maxwell or Maxwell Caledine constraint counting. That's what we just did. That's what we're doing now. Um, and I want to highlight it in a little detail because I want to show you that there's something extra you need to count. So um, let's say that I had this two rigid bar framework and you can see that it's rigid, right? It has exactly the right number of constraints and degrees of freedom to be rigid because it's just two copies of the, you know, it's just this one twice, right? And we just did that counting. But if I had put that extra bar, instead of putting that extra bar here, I put it in here, that would have been stupid <laughs> if I was trying to make a rigid structure, but I could do it. And in that case, I would have an extra floppy mode right? It's pretty obvious I would, but I would pay a price, which is that I would have a self-stress. So a self-stress is a state of stresses on the system that where all the forces are still balanced on all of the points. You can see that would be possible over here. So Caledine basically pointed out that you had to add to this sort of mean field Maxwell thing. You also had to count the number of states of self-stress. Very smart. Okay, good. Okay, but even with that extension, it does not, this does not explain rigidity in any of those systems I just talked to you about. We, we thought about it a lot. It doesn't work at all. Okay, so let me try to go over um, some examples where this simple constraint counting doesn't work. Okay, so the first example is I'm going to approximate a guitar string as M segments, as M little springs, each with rest length L naught. Okay, and I'm allowed, the game I'm allowed to play is exactly the same one I'm allowed to play on a guitar. I can stretch the guitar string. I can move these two endpoints, right? That's what I can do, okay? And so if I make the two endpoints so that they're less than the sort of sum of the rest lengths of all those springs, then this thing is very floppy, okay? I can't pluck it. It's not really a guitar string. It's just, you know, a piece of string that's not on a guitar. But as soon as I pull these two edges beyond that critical point, which is just the rest lengths of all the springs that make it up, you know that this thing becomes rigid, right? You all know this, okay? And the rigidity transition occurs at a particular critical point. I'm for the rest of this talk going to call this critical point L naught star, okay? And I tuned now a single parameter. I didn't change the network connectivity. I didn't change the number of contacts per object. They always had the same one. Instead, I tuned a something else. I tuned a continuous parameter and then I went across the rigidity transition. Okay. There are, um, oh, one important thing. I could do that equally well by either changing this rest length or sorry, changing the edge, the length between the edges, this capital L, or I could have done it by fixing L and changing the rest lengths of the springs. Those two are exactly equivalent. So we're going to be going back and forth between those two things, which can be confusing. So I need to make that point. Okay. Another example, and this is, you know, relevant for the title of this talk, is a lot of mechanical metamaterials, specifically a lot of origami structures. Um, so there, you know, this is a particular Mira-Ori fold pattern that you can basically, people think about the network of edges and vertices of the folds. And you can show, I'm not going to go through any of the details here, there's a nice PRX by one of my collaborators showing that the rigidity in this like origami folds is actually very similar in some deep ways to that guitar string I talked about. Okay, and I'm going to show you a little movie. I don't know if I shared sound. Can you tell me if you can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear uh, the, the sound? particular paper that we wrote in science deals with uh, the Mira Ora uh, fold. Uh, this uh, is basically a, a series of parallelograms um, that, uh, when folded into a sheet of paper, give that paper some mechanical properties uh, that are determined by the fold patterns that we put in to the paper itself. 
The nice thing about this uh, strategy for giving materials uh, mechanical properties is that by changing the fold patterns, for example, I can give the paper a different effective stiffness. I can also introduce new novel mechanical properties. For example, um, if I take a banana and I just squish it in my hand, that banana is going to squirt out the other ends. But this particular pattern, if I expand it in one direction, expands in the other direction. And if I contract it, it contracts in the other direction. All right, so that was Itai Cohen giving us a little mini lecture on mechanical metamaterials. And I think that is the thing that I think is really important to understand about why I find this idea of mechanical metamaterials so cool. It's that you have a situation, so you've made this network of folds, and it's the folds that tell you the mechanics of the material, not the mechanics of the underlying paper that make it up, right? And so that gives you a huge amount of design space to make stuff that you couldn't make. And so obviously I'm going to try to articulate that this is what biology uses to do really cool stuff that normal materials don't do. Okay, that's uh, the, the particular. Okay, I'm done with you, Itai. Okay. Um, okay, so let me give you an example specifically of how these biological tissues do this. Okay, so fiber networks, I told you, can become floppy or rigid depending on the applied strain. And so actually you can just think about um, fiber networks as the 2D analog of the guitar string. They actually are. So you just tune the rest length of the, of the spring and what happens at this critical point is the rest lengths of those springs come, become incommensurate with the size of the box. <laughs> okay, it's more complicated to figure out exactly how that happens, but that's what's happening here. So here's the strain. So I apply, I change the ends of my guitar string, but now it's kind of a two-dimensional guitar string. And there's a critical point at which the rest lengths of the springs can no longer match the sort of length of the box and it stiffens and that's, that's the orders of magnitude increase, okay? And confluent tissues rigidify actually in exactly the same way. They have a different parameter. So it turns out that the parameter that they use is cell shape. Okay, and in a talk that's not very long, well, you know, 45 minutes, especially when I want to tell you a little bit about a rigidity manifesto, I'm not going to go through all of the details. Um, but the point here is, is I can look at the rate at which cells change neighbors, right, which is some metric for fluidity. And you can show that in these sort of types of models for confluent tissues, if the target cell shape is below some critical value in 2D, that number happens to be 3.81, <laughs> um, it is solid-like and otherwise the system becomes fluid-like. Um, and that, that this was a theory prediction, but actually we just published a paper in PNAS where we looked at uh, fruit fly embryos, body axis elongation in fruit fly embryos. And um, this black line is a theoretical prediction with no fit parameters, zero fit parameters of when we expect the transition between a solid and a fluid in this fruit fly body. And the color scale is a measurement in the experiments of how, met, how often cells are changing neighbors in that fruit fly. And so here's a trajectory from one embryo, and then we averaged it over lots and lots of embryos to fill in the phase space. And I would articulate that for a biology experiment, this is a remarkable, uh, remark with no fit parameters. We can predict based on a snapshot, looking at a picture, whether the dynamics of the system is gonna be fluid-like or solid-like. I think that's pretty cool. So we spent like a long time because like this, we did this work in 2015 or 2016 and then like getting to this point where we could do this like really quantitatively took a while, but we, we've done it now. I'm not gonna talk about this model at all. <laughs> Actually, this is a vertex model. It's the model that sort of works for that fruit fly. Importantly, it has the same shape uh, the same sort of energy functional as the spring network, but I will get to that point later. So I'm not going to use this slide to talk about it. There's a lot of biology in there, but I'm not going to talk about that either. The important thing is, is that there is this parameter of cell shape, and I am going to tell you what the cell shape is. It's the sort of dimensionless parameter that comes out of this model, which is that if you look at a, a monolayer of cells, so you're looking at a monolayer of cells, and all the cells, like if you're looking at a bird's eye view, of a single layer of cells, 
and they're confluent, which means there's no gaps or overlaps between them, then they tend to look like a polygonal tiling. And then the obvious thing to measure for a shape of those cells is the cross-sectional area of each polygon and the cross-sectional perimeter of each polygon. So the obvious dimensionless parameter to make of those two length scales is the shape, which is the target perimeter divided by the square root of the target area. So these happen to be the preferred areas of cells and I won't talk about that, but it means that if cells look like this, so they have a large perimeter relative to their area, so they sort of are elongated, that's the easiest way to get that to happen, then the system is fluid-like. And if the cells have a small perimeter relative to their area measured quantitatively by this object, then the system is solid-like. So this is solid-like, this is fluid-like. All right, that's the observation. Oh, and I wanna just, you know, I have, I have 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna show this movie too, because I really like it. Um, I was just watching Terminator 2 the other day, and I wanted to point out that clearly the Terminator 2 is a mechanical metamaterial that has precise, look at this. He starts out as a fluid, right? But he needs, so he needs to become fluid like to like, you know, put his hand through the wall. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like he has to like put his hand through walls in order to, you know, create bad things. But then he has to like become fluid so he can go underneath the, the door or like, you know, he's in a smelting factory and he melts, but then he can reform into a solid. This is the type of thing we would like to be able to design, right? Well, maybe not the evil Terminator, <laughs> maybe like the nice Terminator, but it would be really great to be able to machi build machines that have this type of functionality is, is really the point. Maybe, maybe not this functionality, but similar. Okay, not evil functionality. Okay, so I've saved math until now, and I'm actually not going to really talk too much about the math, um, but I'd like to sort of give you a flavor for it in the next 10 minutes. Okay, how do we go beyond constraint counting? So I explained constraint counting. I showed you that it couldn't possibly work because there's all these examples where the topology of the network doesn't change. Constraint counting says, I count the number of constraints, I count the number of degrees of freedom, and rigidity happens as the number of constraints change, right? The network topology changes. But here we have like a fixed network topology and it becomes rigid. So how is that? Okay. And the old answer is some beautiful work on what are called tensegrity frameworks. And, you know, tensegrity frameworks have actually also been suggested quite a bit as a good behavior, as a good model for cells. And I still think that's right. All of these old works focus on the geometry of the structure. Um, and I'll, I'll be more precise about that in a second, but I just want to give you that idea. They focus on the geometry alone. Okay, and they came up with these definitions. So by what I mean by geometry is, let's say you have one of these bar hinge frameworks or maybe a bar um, uh, cable framework, then you ask, okay, each one of those bars introduces a constraint and that constraint you can talk about just in terms of its geometry. Is the length equal to the rest length? Is it greater than the rest length? Is it less than the rest length? That's a geometry problem. And so all of this old work focused on definitions that were based on constraints. So the, the mathematicians and structural engineers say a material is structurally rigid when there is no non-trivial global motion that preserves the constraints. That makes sense, okay? That's sort of a reasonable definition, but it's really hard. It is a NP hard problem to solve whether that is true or not, even for a simple planar graph. Okay, so what the mathematicians and structural engineers did is they said, let's see if we can come up for, with simpler tests for rigidity that work most of the time or some of the time, right? Are there simpler tests? Okay, and the first test they came up with is first order rigidity, which is that no non-trivial global motions preserve the constraints to first order, to first order and perturbations of those constraints. Makes sense, right? That's the first thing you should do. You do a Taylor expansion and then you ask. And there's also a similar concept, which is just no, which is second order rigidity, no non-trivial global motions to second order. Um, okay, so a floppy system for them is one where you can push on it without changing the constraint. 
physical materials always have an energy functional. Um, and here's where I show you that almost everything we write down from most materials is quadratic to first order <laughs> in a bond or a constraint. That's what we almost always write down and it's very general. So here is that in general, this is that model. I told you about that vertex model for cells. It's quadratic in some constraints, a constraint on the perimeter and a constraint on the area, okay? And similarly for biopolymer networks, there's a constraint on the rest length of the spring and sometimes on the angles that the spring makes, but those are quadratic too. Okay, so why am I making that point? Well, for physicists, a floppy system is one that you can push on without changing the energy. You don't care about the geometry, you care about the energy, okay? The point of all of that is that there may be motions that don't preserve the constraints, but preserve the energy. And a physicist would still call that floppy, right? But a mathematician wouldn't, okay? And that's really interesting to me that somehow this is a gap. Okay, okay, when does this happen? And can we understand the mechanisms driving rigidity? That's the, that's the last five or 10 minutes of this talk. I need some water. All right, so now we've added a new one. We say a system is energetically rigid when any non-trivial global motion increases the energy, okay? So now we have this list. Um, and the question that we're gonna ask is, you know, when does one of these things imply the other things, <laughs> right? How do we know when something is energetically rigid or not? Can we use some of these simple proxies in order to predict something is energetically rigid? Are there cases where it doesn't work at all? What happens? Okay, so let me first define like very carefully what I mean by energetic rigidity. So suppose we have an energy that is quadratic and a sum of constraints for n degrees of freedom. Okay, so for example, this would be sort of a spring, this, this sort of constraints would be like a spring, right? Which says that L is the rest, the actual length of the spring minus the rest length of the spring. And the energy is quadratic in that constraint. Okay, okay. And then you sum over all the springs. Then very importantly, because we have an energy functional and we insist on having one, we require that our system is initialized at a local minimum of the energy, which is something that never appears in the structural rigidity literature, which is interesting because a lot of cool things happen when you require this. And so what that means is that we can think about perturbations around some local minimum and the properties of that, okay? We perturb the system coordinates. We look at the variation. This is standard stuff now. And so you get the following, you get, you know, the variations in energy to second order and the perturbation. And then we just say, okay, the, this energetic floppiness condition just says that, you know, if there exists at least one direction in which the landscape is flat to second order, then the system is floppy. That's how we're gonna define energetic rigidity. It turns out that you can go to higher orders and that's interesting, but I won't talk about it today. Okay. Okay, so if this equation is satisfied, the system is floppy, otherwise we call it energetically rigid. So this is the formal definition. For those of you who work on stuff like this, this is just the Hessian matrix. Okay, and importantly, this is actually really important. The Hessian can be written as the sum of what's called, well, it's called like different things in different places, but I'm gonna call it, this is a sort of Gramian term of the rigidity matrix. Um, so the rigidity matrix is a matrix that has M, which is the number of constraints rows and N degrees of freedom columns. And it shows up in all sorts of problems on rigidity theory, because it's the obvious thing to think about. And this is the pre-stress matrix is it is only non-zero if the system is pre-stressed. So the constraints aren't satisfied at the local energy minimum. Again, an idea that doesn't show up in structural rigidity. Okay. So we have this like energetic floppiness condition. Okay, now with all of this formalism, we can say, okay, what is constraint counting in terms of this formalism, which is this like first order proxy that mathematicians use? So a first order zero mode is a set of displacements that preserve constraints to first order. So it is in the right null space of what's called the rigidity matrix. That's kind of how you define the rigidity matrix. Um, and you know, if there are no first order zero modes, that's first order rigid. 
And this is secretly what I told you about the Maxwell-Caledine theorem. So the Maxwell-Caledine theorem basically says, well, a state of cell stress is a set, set of stresses on bonds of the network that do not result in any displacements. So that means it has to be in the left null space of this rigidity matrix. Okay, and then you just use linear algebra rank nullity theorem to write down the maxwell caladine constraint counting. So first order rigidity is maxwell caladine constraint counting. Um, and now we can start to think about how this is related to energetic rigidity. Okay, there's also second order rigidity. Um, I am not going to go through this math. I am not going to go through it. I'm going to tell you that you can go through it and we'll have a paper on the archive on Monday. Um, and it's a lot of math. Okay. And oh, the important thing though is that there's a self stress that appears in this equation for second order rigidity. And that state of self stress is really important to what I'm going to talk about next. So that's the, I, I'm not going to go through any of this. You just have to believe me. There is a state of self stress that appears there. Second order rigidity is not an NP hard problem, it's a P hard problem. You can check it using Mathematica. Okay, so we want to know then, because in general, rigidity is a NP hard problem. But if you can make it a first order rigidity problem, then it's real easy. If you can make it a second order rigidity problem, it's a little harder, but it's P hard. Okay, and so you wanna be able to classify. So we did that. Um, this is the answer. <laughs> so there are four cases. You want to think about whether the system has self-stresses or no self-stresses. And then you also want to think about whether this pre-stress matrix is zero, positive semi-definite, or negative semi-definite. Okay, and so we can classify, I'm, again, uh, I'm trying to give you a sketch. You don't need to know all the details. But the point is, is now we can enumerate cases where second order rigidity enumerates or basically implies energetic rigidity. So you can use a second order test or a first order test. So these green boxes are when constraint counting works. So this is like granular systems, okay? If you have these cases. Second order rigidity is when, um, when second order rigidity works. It turns out that most of the biological systems I talked about, fiber networks and vertex models are in this class. And then there's a third class that's really interesting and is indeterminate in some ways, okay? Cool. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide too, because I only have three more minutes. So if you care, the mathematicians have a whole different language for this because they don't care about energy. And we've gone through and carefully like mapped out using theorems when things that are energetically rigid, rigid like correspond to various things in the mathematics literature. Okay. The important thing is this, this last point. If you have a system where the energy is greater than zero, which means the local minimum that you get stuck in, that the system, the physics of the system drives you to, is a system where the constraints aren't satisfied, but you get stuck there because that's the local minimum of the energy, then there can be motions that preserve the constraints, but don't preserve the energy. Okay. And so in that case, structural rigidity is not what you want. If you're a physicist, you want this new thing that we're talking about, which is energetic rigidity. Okay, so I am going to tell you very briefly, okay, I told you these models, um, cells um, and spring networks are in the case where um, second order rigidity works, okay, and we can write down them and we can solve the second order rigidity equations using Mathematica and it all works, so that's pretty cool. Okay, so what I'm telling you is the answer to my question why do these biological systems become rigid? It's because they become rigid to second order in the constraints, right? Not to first order. And that's neat. It has some implications for biology. Okay, I'm going to also skip, okay, it works in a spring network. Oh, I will show you a simulation of what happens when you cross the rigidity transition. So this is what happens when you cross, oh, you see it? You cross the rigidity transition. So everything, you're just straining this box. So the box is unstrained and then there's a bunch of springs in there and then there's a critical point at which there's a state of self-stress that pops in and the whole thing becomes rigid, right? And now we understand the mechanism, it's second order rigidity that generates that physics. Cool. Oh, and I'm not gonna talk about this, sorry. I put a lot in this talk. This is the first time I've given this talk about our rigidity manifesto and I put too much in. Okay, but the other thing I wanted to tell you is that it works for the vertex model. So let me show you some pictures because pictures are fun. This isn't math. 
of what happens if you look at movies, if you're across the rigidity transition. So again, these two um, systems um, are, um, this one looks like it is, it's at a higher temperature. It's not, it just has a slightly larger cell shape, a shape that the cells want to have. And so in the presence of fluctuations, this system is floppy. And so in the presence of fluctuations, the cells move around and change neighbors. And in the solid phase, the fluctuations allow the cells to jiggle around, but they don't change neighbors. And again, the mechanism generating this rigidity transition is the second order rigidity, not first. Okay. So rigidity in many standard materials is described by first order rigidity. That's what we're all used to, right? You change the pressure, the, the atoms get more contacts, right? And, or the molecules, depending exactly, okay, there's some other stuff, but that's what we know. But rigidity in biological tissues, which is confluent cellularized tissues in extracellular matrix, is described by energetic rigidity, this new concept we introduce. Um, and in those model systems in particular, ECM and cellularized tissues, this second order rigidity explains their, the origin of rigidity. Okay. Cool thing is that metamaterials rigidified by higher order rigidity do not require changes to the topology of the network. Okay, so that's pretty great for biological system and for materials design. That's why mechanical metamaterials are cool. Okay, because you don't have to change the topology of the network, which is a hard design problem. You change a tuning parameter and you get some a totally new material. And you might even be able to do it locally or dynamically, right? Pretty neat, just like the Terminator 2. Okay, so instead the onset of rigidity occurs when the state of self-stress appears due to very small changes in parameters, like changing the spring rest length or the strain of the system or the shape of the cell, the target shape of the cell by a little bit. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about the relevance to biology experiments because I'm over time, but there is some and I'm happy to discuss it with individuals later. We've really shown that these things are working <laughs> in biological systems. Okay, could this be an interesting design principle for bio-inspired materials? What is the space of designs? Why does biology take advantage of? I'm really excited about this if you can't tell. Okay, I won't, I won't play the Terminator again. I will just go to my conclusion slide uh, and take questions, thanks. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So if you also enjoyed the talk and you're in the Zoom session, please write something in Zoom in the chat. Uh, I can share the chat transcript with Professor Manning at the end. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube and you enjoyed it, please write something in the YouTube chat, uh, let us know. If you have a question at this stage uh, and you're in the Zoom session, you'd like to ask your question in person, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you're on YouTube and you want to ask a question, please type something into the YouTube chat. Uh, that information will be passed to me by my sidekick. Uh, and if you want to ask a question privately or anonymously in Zoom, please feel free to type it into the Zoom chat and I will also address it. Um, so that we have a question already loaded up. It was kind of a question during the talk, but it was right during your, your, your summary and wrap up. Uh, it was a question about the order parameter uh, that was varying in the example. I think if you go back, I'm not even sure exactly which example was referred to, but there was an order parameter that was being varied. Maybe it was this picture. But yeah, it was probably that picture in the next slide, the, the, the one that we just passed. Oh. Uh, no, I think two, two ahead. There was an order parameter phi, which I presume <laughs> is the order parameter that was referenced here, but I'm not sure. Um, does I'm the, sorry. So, so the person who asked that question, if you could specify which slide it was, if you know. Uh, so Paul Francois thinks it's the previous slide. He tells me in the chat. So this one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what's happening here in this model is that um, cells, biological cells, actually have a really um, sort of broad capacity to change their shapes because they have sticky molecules called cadherins that allow them to stick to other cells. And that makes the cells want to have more surface area in contact with other cells. So if you express more, this is a little bit dicey, but okay, the, the idea is right. Then as you express more cadherins, you make more contacts with other cells. And so you want to have a larger surface area relative to your area. 
Um, then there's a counter sort of force, which is that cells have cortical actomyosin, which sort of serves to round up cells. That makes cells want to be rounder and to have less area in contact with their neighbors. So by changing the expression levels of these sort of biological molecules or their dynamics, cells can tune the shape that they want to have, the target shape, the relative perimeter relative to their area. And so what I'm changing in this plot, this order parameter, so this is the shear modulus of uh, one of these simulations, just a measure of the uh, stiffness of the tissue. And this is the shape that cells want to have. And so if cells have an, one of these elongated shapes, if that's what they want to have, then the shear modulus is zero. And if they sort of try to round up more in these skin fluid tissues, then there's a critical point. And it, actually, this is a real um, Ising <laughs> model critical point, which is cool, um, that um, uh, they start to, to have a finite shear modulus. Is that answer? Okay, thanks. Yeah. And now there's a question from Professor Paul Francois. Paul, would you like to ask? Yes. Yeah, so, thank you. Great talk. Uh, that was really fantastic. Uh, I have a question. I'm sure you have this question many times. So, of course, uh, we all biological tissue. You would have different type of cells, and some will have different constraints. And so, you could imagine that some part of the tissue would be more solid-like, some more fluid-like. So, how how does that you know fit into your energetic uh, rigidity uh, framework? Like how, how could you get, you know, this kind of mixtures to work? That's a, so it's, that's, it's a good question. Um, I, I can give you a partial answer, although it's an active area we're thinking about. So um, a former a, a postdoc of mine who's now um, faculty at Northeastern Max Dapeng B um, published a paper not too long ago where he demonstrated that you can kind of get away in these types of second order rigidity systems with thinking about individual cells as being rigid if they're above this, or you know, rigid if they're below the shape index and fluid-like if they're above this shape index. And actually then if you do that, um, a rigidity percolation picture works really well to predict rigidity. <laughs> So, um, which is cool because rigidity percolation is an idea that's really kind of goes back to being like a first order rigidity picture. Um, and so I'm still sort of trying to work that out exactly in my head, but that's, there's some, he's collapsed the data in a really nice way by thinking about it as like, you can just put a threshold at this critical point and then think about rigidity percolation. One small other thing is we have looked at what happens if you have mixtures of cells of two different shapes and whether they sort because that's another thing that happens in biological systems is you get spontaneous sorting if you have different types of cells a lot. So it turns out um, if you have two different shapes, which might lead to two different rigidities, kind of very robustly, you get a micro demixing, but no macroscopic demixing. There's no energetic, there's some kinetic traps that keep them a little bit demixed, um, but there's no macroscopic demixing, which I think is part of what allows that rigidity percolation work to work, um, is that you don't get sorting. And so then you can sort of just look at sort of a mean field type calculation. It's a really good question. Okay, thank you very much. We've got a couple of questions from YouTube to get to now. Uh, first question from YouTube, uh, what about single cells? Is there a liquid solid transition in terms of protein plaques or the actin mesh network's topology? Oh, good. Um, yes, that's a really good question. And one that I'm probably, um, I have not thought about enough to give like a really good answer. So let me give a, a bad one, which is that um, um, there, there is a lot of controversy about how much activity of like enzymes and motors, fluidizes and um, that sort of things like the actin cytoskeleton, for example, that sort of are generally understood to be responsible for the rigidity of single cells. And so there's a, there's some pretty good, like nice work um, on continual models for like, um, active gels uh, models for the internal dynamics of these systems that have both activity and dynamic cross-linkers. And so what seems to be the case based on what I've read is, is that the, the, the actin cytoskeleton itself could, depending on its geometry, look like one of those ECM networks I talked about, like those spring fiber network models. 
but really because of the how active and dynamic everything is and that the cross linkers are dynamic and that there's motors all the time it seems like in most cell types that fluidizes that system so the cytoskeleton is viscoelastic and there's a characteristic time scale on which it behaves like a solid but on long time scales almost all cell types are very fluid like if you're talking about the cells that move around now there's other cell types that like live in bone and there's like other you know there's other things that happen um, but I think the short answer or intermediately long answer is, is that they're viscoelastic um, and visco, like I forget, I always get Kelvin models and Maxwell models mixed up. They're the one that's fluid on long time scales. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question from YouTube. Uh, what happens when quantum mechanics is important and tunneling can happen? Uh, then you have to change the definition of energetic rigidity. There's a question mark at the end. <laughs> um, that's really fun. Uh, so, you know, the good news is, is that the scale of, so, so I'll answer your question in two ways. For the tissues and the extracellular matrix that we're talking about, um, temperature fluctuations are really not sufficient to drive dynamics. They're not high enough because these things are on the scale of microns already. And so if you're trying to think about the fluctuations that are driving this type of behavior, they're really active fluctuations driven by ATP. So they're at sort of energy scales that are very far from ones where quantum mechanics would traditionally be important. Um, however, I will say that I also work on the physics of glasses a lot. And I will say that there are some really interesting similarities between the low frequency vibrational modes and there's localized vibrational modes in both these systems and in glasses. And that those really do contribute to interesting tunneling behavior in glasses. And so like, if you did the thought experiment that if you put these things at zero temperature and asked would quantum mechanics do interesting things, it would because there's really interesting like two level systems in these materials, but they're not at a scale where it's relevant unless you do a Gedanken experiment. Okay, uh, and that answer sort of takes us to the very last question or the, I mean, maybe it's almost the last question from YouTube. Uh, it's actually flows pretty well from that. Um, can the rigidity transition be likened to a glass transition or is it, uh, or it is rate dependent, rate independent? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I talked about the jamming transition, right? I talked about sort of the zero temperature when I compressed things and I avoided talk it, talking about what happened when you lower the temperature because as this question points out, the glass transition is really a lot more challenging than rigidity transitions because in glass, trans what really happens is things are still, they're not rigid, they're still allowed to move locally but they're sort of the particles, the atoms get trapped in a cage of their neighbors. Okay. And so there's a lot of interesting phenomena that happens because of that, because it's not quite, I mean, glasses are rigid, but they're rigid in a different way than this rigidity transition that I've been talking about, because we're sort of saying absolutely rigid at zero temperature so far. And so it's very interesting what happens to systems when you put just a little temperature on them and then take the limit that the temperature goes to zero because you don't get the same answer, <laughs> which is really cool. And that's the glass transition. So your question was, are some of these transitions similar to the glass transition? And the answer is yes, because the low frequency excitations in these systems share a lot of features with glasses, which is surprising given that the origin of rigidity is different. One is first order, one is second order, right? So in glasses, the origin of rigidity is like, if you go to zero temperature, the origin of rigidity in glasses is first order, whereas in these systems it's second order. But the, like, there's a lot of similarities about the vibrational, the low frequency vibrational spectrum, which might be, be a generic feature of having like a, disordered network because a lot of the physics of those vibrational modes is deeply related to the theory of random matrices. Um, but also there are some differences and I'll give you one because if you like glass physics, this is to me is the most interesting. One of the big differences is that in normal glasses, things are what are there, things are typically what's called super Arrhenius. And what that means is that as you go to lower temperatures, the energy barriers get higher and higher. 
which is pretty intuitive, right? Like the energy barriers between states and your potential energy landscape get higher. And these models and these like, like these 2D vertex models, it's the opposite. They're subterraneous. So actually, as you go to lower temperatures, the energy barriers get lower and lower. And historically, we had no way to explain that, but it could be related to this idea of it being second order rigidity, but that's brand new. And I haven't thought about it at all. Okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, we've run out of time for questions, unfortunately, but uh, if you haven't already done so and you appreciated the talk and you're in the Zoom session, please write something in the Zoom chat. Uh, if you're on YouTube and you enjoyed the talk, please write something in the YouTube chat. Um, if you're a grad student or undergrad or anyone who doesn't have a tenured or tenure track position, please stick around uh, because there will be an après colloque in the Zoom session. Uh, you'll get a chance to talk to Professor Manning a little bit more. Uh, so I just want to wrap up by telling everyone uh, that uh, there's a here's a quick preview of our upcoming schedule. Uh, next week we're off YouTube, but we'll have a Zoom only event, uh, the presentation of the Department Climate Survey results. So if you're from the Physics Department, please come to the Zoom session for that. On mm -hmm. the week of March 5th, we'll have the March break, so there'll be no Physical Society Colloquium. But please do come back on March 12th. On Friday, March 12th, we'll have a talk by uh, Professor Stefan Alexander, The Jazz of Physics, Music, and the Structure of the Universe. It'll be a co-presented talk with the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Music, Media, and Technology. Good evening. Bye.